The USS Cairo disappeared on patrol in the Romulan neutral zone. The Dominion has invaded Beta Z, and real Kalival should forcibly open one's sinuses before the first sip, of course. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk. Today, we are doing a review of Deep Space Nine, Season 6, Episode 19. This is the one, everybody, In the Pale Moonlight, story by Peter Allen Fields, teleplay by Victor, sorry, teleplay by Michael Taylor, and directed by Victor Lobel. This is April 15th, 1998. Hey, tax day, cool. And uh, at the top, we'd like to give a very special thanks to Tristan Van Oss and the enigma known as Medallion for this episode. How you doing, Sirach? Sweet, 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 sweet. Wow, what an episode. <laughs> That's why Tristan Van Oss and Medallion were like, I want this one. I don't blame them. This is the one. Also want to give a story story by credit to Peter Allen Fields, who mm -hmm. um, came up with this idea. So, And what an idea it is. <laughs> so this is one of these times where I'm like, okay, I know we both have a ton to say. Where the do we start with this? First of all, I know where to start. Sirach, I love your shirt. Your sister made it at her uh, online store, abyssiniankiosk.com. Check it out in the description box below. It's definitely one of my favorite creations of hers. <laughs> the color scheme is awesome. It is the continent Thank of you. Africa, and I love it. Go get yours today. I do love the shirt. Age as well. The more you wash it, the more vintage it kind of feels. So some shirts are just like that and kind of luck of the draw on those kinds of things. But um, yes, where to start? I think we got to start with the opening scene. Like it really starts with Cisco by himself having this kind of conversation with himself in this um, kind of psychoanalyzing what he's done and the decisions that he's forced to make and positions he's been put in. Yeah. And I love the way that it opens like that because I actually feel like we, I feel like this could have been the blueprint for this show as far as Cisco kind of starting with these kinds of conversations with himself. Mm -hmm. um, he, he talks about, you know, I, you know, I can't say this to Dax. I can't say this to anybody. There's no one else. There's no one I can talk to. So I have to air this out um, with the computer. <laughs> This and is, and I love that. I love yeah. that concept. This is like the quintessential Cisco episode. Uh, you know, Cisco goes through a lot of kind of changes and a metamorphosis as the seasons go. Some of it is, um, you know, through the writing. Some of it is the way he looks. Some of it is just when the writers allowed him to play the type of character that he's best at rather than fit him into what they were trying, what they were looking for initially for season one and two, et cetera. But this to a lot of the fans is the quintessential Captain Cisco episode. It's just so many memes have come from it. There's this one. This is a, this is one of the most, possibly the <laughs> most famous uh, Cisco picture. There's also another one, um, I don't remember the episode, but what's when they're down on a planet like last season and he's and he's pointing, he's like, get that man out of here or something like that. That's another one. But the biggest one, the biggest meme that everybody knows is uh, what's his name? Senator Vreenak, right? Senator, when he holds mm -hmm. up that uh, that rod, that data rod, and he goes, it's a fake, right? Yeah. That image of him, it's a fake is as big yeah. as Kirk saying, Khan! Wow. Yes. Wow. And do they uh, substitute whatever's in his hand with something else, or, or they just use that image exactly how it is? Well, I'm glad you asked, Sirach, and I tried to find the image, but um, there was one time that I saw, and I can't find it right now, but there was one time that I saw where instead of the data rod, and I feel like I may have shown this to you, and instead of the data rod, they have a little Jake Cisco there, and it says, 
It's a Jake. <laughs> <laughs> the coolest thing uh, I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> That's the only time Anyone I've seen, ever seen them like yeah. change what's in his hand and alter what he's saying. Okay. Yeah, I definitely need one of those uh, on a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love this episode, man. The pace of it is amazing. The uh, the gravity of the situation is intense. You know, we've got the <clears throat> we're like we're we're really starting on this Dominion War and seeing that the casualties that it's taking. We see mm-hmm. the the list the list that Cisco has to put on that bulletin every day, and you know, and face face his own crew's uh morale kind of deflating as they see friends and family and 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 people that they're colleagues that are falling victim to this war and that i think sets the tone for um the gravity of the situation and how much is at stake um for cisco and the decision that he has to be uh that he's forced to kind of make in these moments yeah um it really does you know, every once in a while they have an episode that kind of sets the table and reminds us this, we are at war. It sucks. Sometimes they have a light episode within the dominion war, but a lot of times they have to kind of bring an episode that grounds us and says, we are still at war. There are many deaths. People are dying that we actually know, you know, and it's, it's, so so good it's it's very rare in star trek to have episodes like this where they really slog through the depths of war uh most star trek series and episodes are about preventing war you know captain picard saving the day and preventing a war Catherine Janeway showing up when their two races are at war and she negotiates a peace, peace treaty between the two or something. You know, that's kind of what it's about. But Deep Space Nine examines what if all else failed and we actually were at war and they really just, just swim through the mud and the muck and the darkness, you know, and the death and the yeah, because what we we know we tradition. Uh oh, I lost I you there for a second. Ryan, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, there you are. Yeah, I think. I'm... Yeah, sorry, I lost my signal, but um, no, no problem. But yeah, no. What I I I love the fact that what they're doing is also showing kind of the ugliness of war the mm-hmm. decisions that are the decisions that may be compromising whatever morality that we naturally have as human beings and and you know uh having to weigh this idea of lesser of two evils or the greater good um so you know i i think that what Cisco is faced with here is a moral dilemma. And yet the stakes are so high that he's almost willing to do anything it takes. You know, he starts off the line, the script was saying, I have to justify what's happened, what I've done, at least to myself. And so that set the stage for the whole thing. He's yeah, I was justifying- wondering. Yeah. Is that the kind of thing that makes you a first time viewer mentally lean in like, oh boy, yes, whoa, yes. Cisco's gone dark. He's done something he's not proud of. This yes. is, this is interesting. <laughs> right away when he says, I have to justify what I've done, at least to myself. And we already know, boom. And he says, I can't talk to anybody else. Dax doesn't understand. So we already know the gravity of this. This is like something personal. This is an insight into Cisco's mind, which he wouldn't let otherwise be exposed to anybody in a conversation, right? This is his inner thoughts. This is his intimate ideas. And and that's why I think we could have used more of this uh, throughout the show to kind of really get inside Cisco's head more because I love this. I love getting inside of Cisco's head. Right. And he, and he's amazing at at performing these kinds of pieces in which you are inside his head 
And so he's convincing himself, he's convincing the audience, he's, he's, he's masterful at these kinds of performances. And I think this is, I just kept writing A++ as if I was grading yeah. a paper. Yes. <laughs> as if I was a teacher grading a paper, I wrote A++, A++. Uh, very few times that I have two notes, two pages of notes. This is just like I couldn't fill it all in one page. I had to get another page. Almost three pages where I. Wow, that's a record. <laughs> it is a record. And it was just that much mo- uh, that much in it. Um, for example, when he says that was the moment, it was like I stepped through a door. Boom. It's just those little moments where he's telling you, now I'm about to go. Now, you know, like he's telling you is um, what's happening. And I love these kinds of narrations too, by the way. Um, I'm a big fan of, um, what was that show called? The Wonder Years with Fred Savage and Dan Yeah, oh, I loved it, yeah. And there was a narration inside of that uh, show, which I, I just love it when they narrate story. Princess Bride is another movie with Peter Falk where he's narrating at certain points about Wallace, what's happening. Wallace Shawn, yeah, our Wallace, buddy. Yeah. Wallace Shawn, yeah. So I love when people give you that extra voice of, of insight in, in an episode or, uh, you know, on screen and, and cinematically. And that's what I got in this episode. So I was just like, I was hooked from the beginning and it just kept me rolling. You know, I'm so glad uh, to hear you say that because I didn't want to say anything ahead of time to prepare you or to warn you or to you know anything to influence you in any way and i was hoping that you would show up here with <laughs> with big eyes like holy shit because this is a holy shit episode yeah um let me ask you this would you say this is kind of this kind of going going crazy here in the middle of a segment would you say this is the best episode you've ever seen? Mm. I know. Yeah. It's, it's funny because as I was watching this, I thought to myself how many times I said, this I is the best episode I've ever seen. So, know. you know, it's like, I, I know. I, how many times have we said this? I've said this with Far Beyond the Star. I said this with The Visitor. I said the duet. I These are amazing. They're not like just okay these are like yeah. masterpiece episodes so i've said that many times now watching the show and that's why i feel like wow this is it just doesn't let up it always it always gives me that it doesn't it doesn't always give you that one I, there'll, there'll be a filler episode here and there a little you know mm-hmm. little com- comedy or or a sidetrack episode or about one per- particular character but when they get on pace, on track for whatever the story, the main line of the story, which they've done an excellent job of setting up this whole Dominion War, the Jemadar, the, the Vorta, the Founders, I mean, how it ties into uh, Odo and how it ties into, you know, what everybody's doing, how they all have their, their you know, their things in the fire, uh, their coal in the fire, their rakes in the fire. They, each one of them has some kind of connection to this and the way they've built this up with so many layers, and now we're getting to the Romulans and the, and getting them enticed into the war. This is like upping the stakes to the maximum level. And uh, you know there were so many good things in this episode. The Romulans are now allowing the Jemadar to use their airspace to, yeah. to you know to attack. These are actually war type strategies and yeah. war type conversations, right? Yeah, walking into their backyard to give your enemy a bloody nose, right? Great little analogy right. that Dax made. Um, sometimes the analogies are a little, a little silly, but sometimes they really work. Like that one was, uh, that one yes. was a great one. And there wasn't a there wasn't a B plot, which is cool. It just followed one man's story. This was a this was a Cisco and Garrick episode. Um, you know, a lot of people think this might be Cisco's best episode. Certainly one of them. A lot of people think that this is certainly one of Garrick's best episodes as well, even though he's not necess- he's not like the main character of this episode, but we certainly get now, he a play- lot of he, good he, Garrick. Uh, I'm glad you said that because Andrew Robinson is fantastic in this episode. Mm-hmm. He is he plays this coy, 
he plays he he's he's waiting to be convinced by Cisco yeah to do it right he already wants to do it like this he, yeah. he's being the given the green the green light to you know to basically you know yield the kind of power that you know unlimited power right you can anybody can be killed anybody can whatever you've got to do to get this done you know i'll i'll get people out of jail i'll you know i'll forge things i'll i'll give out biogenetic weapon material mm-hmm. to an unknown group to who right? the fuck knows <laughs> he's like i don't know just don't tell me i don't want to know yeah yeah and you and you see bashir he's like uh i'm going to have to write about i'm going to write this up yeah. you know i'm going to like he, I have an ethics. I live by code of ethics. I'm going to have to like this is not on me, bro. This is on yeah. you. And he has to make happens. it official, not just say it. Right. He's like, I got to put this in writing, dude. Yeah. And Cisco's like, I knew you'd say that. Here you go. It's on me, right? So if some planet blows up somewhere with some biogenetic weapon because of what you just did, that's on you, Cisco. Because I got it in writing. I had nothing to do with it. I objected to it. I wrote Starfleet. I told them about it. And yet uh, Cisco says he has Starfleet's approval. So, and this is something that goes on every day in all type of countries and different governments, you know, these kind of covert off the record type of activities that are, you know, meant to uh, basically kind of win, right? To get you to win in some type of way or another. However, you've got to manufacture the win. You are, your ultimate and, uh, you know, final objective is to win right not mm-hmm. or not lose essentially and um and so it's a it's very real that what they're talking about and i think garrick once been i'm sorry i, I kind of went off course but that's okay going back i know there's a ton <laughs> yeah so going much. back to andrew robinson what garrick does what andrew robinson does the whole time he's like so you're saying i have to oh well you know and it's like Tell me more. Tell me more. Mm-hmm. What else convince would you me. like? Oh, convince yeah. me. I boy, twist my arm. Yeah. 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 You and know, so I love the dynamic there. Yeah, there's so much you touched on there. Uh, but, and I want to talk about all of it. Of Obviously, it's all stuff that I was thinking about when I was watching. But one thing I hadn't thought of was with regards to Garrick's character, for all we know, he could have very well just lied to Cisco and said, oh, all my connections got killed. And so this is the way we have to do it. Cisco didn't verify that. What if he just made the whole thing? Because remember, at the end, Cisco was kind of a pawn in Garrick's game where Garrick was like, oh, yeah, I led you to believe all that stuff just because probably it was going to go this way. And, you know, what if all of his connections weren't killed, which is what led them down that path of having to do it this way what if he didn't even contact his connections what if he was just like okay cisco's not going to agree to this unless he's forced to and this 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 so he just you know cracks open this plan it's entirely possible we never even find out if he's he just might have just bullshitted the whole thing just because he was like there's only one way to guarantee this is going to work There is a line from Scarface, I believe it is, and I think it was uh, uh, Tony Montana, Al Pacino, who said, I always tell the truth, even when I lie. Mm. That's a Garrick sounding okay. line, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, and that reminds me of Garrick. It's like, Garrick, we don't know if he's telling the truth or not. That's That's... That's the beauty of Garrick. It's like you don't know when he's lying. You don't know. Most people you can kind of gauge and say, that, that's a lie. That's not right. You know, but with him, he's so clever. He's so smooth about how he delivers it and he throws things away. It's up. It's kind of left up to the, <laughs> it's left up to you. What do you think? You know, is it true or not? And, mm-hmm. and really, it doesn't matter. Because Garrick always presents you with an op with one choice. He acts like it's two choices, but he only <laughs> gives you the one. Yeah. Right? He's yeah. like, uh, we could do it like this, or we could just all die over here. So yeah. the you know, choice is yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> so yeah. that's Garrick's uh, way of presenting things. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's remarkable here. And I think the final scene with him and Cisco is probably the best scene uh, with two characters in it. Cause Cisco had the best scene, I think by himself with nobody in it, but the best scene with two characters was the final scene with uh, Andrew Robinson and, and Avery where the two of them kind of go, where he comes in and he slaps them out. Yeah, 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 yeah. He starts whooping his ass like, you know, I'm, you pissed me off. You're like, you got over on me. You tricked me. And Garrick's like, stop. All right, all right, calm down. You know, if you just let your ego and your your hurt feelings get out of the way, you knew that I was going to do this. And that, that was one of my favorite lines, um, you know, in this, in this whole episode was that, where he says... Um, that's why you came to me, isn't it, Captain? Yeah. You knew I could do these things that you weren't capable of doing. Well, it worked. And that's, I mean, that was just like mm -hmm. golden. It's, just, that's, it was, it's like that line that you're saying, I, I always tell the truth even when I lie. It, this is like he, he carries out the mission even even under the pretenses that the mission was to be carried out in a different way. Because the, the bottom line, the emotional truth behind it was Cisco was like, I need to find somebody that's going to carry this out no matter what. They can figure out the details as much as they want. But really, the real thing was just whatever it takes. And that's what, what's funny about that is it brought me to a point which is exactly the same discussion we had last week. Last week with uh, the Inquisition in Section 31, we were talking about, does the ends justify the means? Mm -hmm. And this is an even bigger example of the ends justify the means, which is mm -hmm. <laughs> Gar Garrick's brilliant line of, I, I don't want, let, let me not misquote it. He says, you have saved the entire Alpha Quadrant, and all it cost was the life of one Romulan senator, one criminal, and the self-respect of one Starfleet officer. I don't know about you, but I call that a bargain. <laughs> oh <my. laughs> mm. <laughs> you can't beat it. <laughs> You can't beat that. It's yeah. and that's what I found myself doing is like literally writing down the right. It was like I wanted to write this the whole script down. I could have yeah. sat there and just wrote line for line the whole script. <laughs> you know, I did do that um, for we Cisco's were... final monologue. I couldn't help it. I yeah. just started typing, and I was like, "You just keep singing, Cisco. I'm typing away. I got this whole thing. I, yeah. I got you, man. I got you." I was a I stenographer. <laughs> yeah, it's a stenographer. That's how I felt as well. You know, when uh, when I was a kid in junior high school and high school. When new songs came out, we would write them all down, all the yep. lyrics down. It was it was the thing to do. It was before they actually even had the the uh, lyrics published. Sometimes in the inside of the CD cassette kit or cover, CD, yeah, or, yeah, cassette, right? So we would just write it down ourselves, and we would write all that, and we'd pass it around. So it would be like, "Yo, that's that new song," you know. Kids in school would get, get the new lyrics, and for me, it was like it was like that. It was like pause, Cisco, you got it, man. <laughs> play pause yeah. you got it play yeah. pause yeah. over and over again it's just a bunch of that even with dax i love the scene between cisco and dax in the beginning the the whole where she's playing the devil's advocate romulan type of character very well yeah coming coming back at cisco like i i don't believe you i need proof you know and and the whole proof of dominion duplicity is and not just words you know that that was like it was another beautiful moment. It was like, okay. And Cisco walks around like, hmm, you're right. That's the that's how it'll go out. That's how it'll play out. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, flash forward later on, this Romulan senator, by the way, who was very good at playing a guy that I yeah. ha hated, that I actually yeah. didn't mind. Like, so they must have made him somebody. Uh, they might, must have made him so crass and vulgar so that you wouldn't be so sad when he died at the end, right? I think there must have been some point. level of that. Yeah, good point. Be be because both him and the cr the criminal or whatever he is were kind of guys that you were like, mm, I wouldn't be so happy. They could go. If he died. <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So there was it must have been an intentional thing because 
you know, you watch Romulan, for example, the Romulan in Discovery, this, the, the, the woman in, uh, who's the president, right? Oh, Vulcan. Uh, involved uh, Tarina. Yeah. Yeah. Very, you know, super compassionate. Somebody you care for, you would be, you'd hate to see something happen to her. But this guy, he seemed like <laughs> such a jerk. He's like, you yeah, know, he walks on the, he walks on the ship and he's like, yeah, I don't mind taking a look around and, you know, before this place gets destroyed. You know, he's such a, he's such he a jerk, right? He was throwing right? fireballs at him, man. I loved it. Hang on. Yeah. We, we got to jump to our break already. Um, but le- I definitely want to talk more about him. And I definitely also want to talk more about uh, what the point of this story was. And it's kind of what, what we have seen in the military and governments do. Uh, like what you touched on. And we'll talk a bit more about that because I think that's a really big point. Uh, We'll be right back on the seventh rule. Well, hello, everybody. We are back. Sorok just took a sip from an Abyssinian kiosk mug. Can we see that again real quick? (laughs) Oh, yeah. This is one of the... There it is. You can also get that at his sister's shop, abyssiniankiosk.com, in the description box below. Very quickly we want to get back into it here are the trivioids captain cisco can't remember what day it is the uss cairo disappeared on patrol in the romulan neutral zone the romulans have a treaty of non-aggression and friendship with the dominion jadzia dax prefers the spots to the romulan pointed ears captain cisco posted his 14th casualty list and he's tired of it The Dominion has invaded Beta Z. All of Garrick's contacts were killed within one day of speaking to him, theoretically. Um, Graython Tolar tries to kill Quark. Garrick added a little petty bickering and mutual loathing between Weyoun and Goldemar to make a Holosuite program more believable. And real Kalival should forcibly open one's sinuses before the first sip. Okay, so back in on this um actually that quote was obviously from from senator vrenak you're talking about vrenak as soon as he walked on and started speaking i was hit with something i hadn't noticed before i was like dude this guy has got to do voiceover the way he speak or maybe he does i'll have to look him up in a second but just the way he talks to everyone with such contempt and this delivery of i mean it's just it was just yeah. such a beautiful voice and way of delivering things like you can see why they cast him uh yeah he like i said he was the the good guy that you really think is a bad guy who you know comes across like a bad guy um he said to Cisco at some point, Cisco says, well, I hope I didn't offend you. He says, oh, I have such a low opinion of Starfleet. <laughs> <laughs> it would be hard to offend me. Like, it was like, it would be hard to disappoint me or something. You know, and just basically just right away cuts into him. Like, you know, Starfleet is, sucks. You know, um, let me look around your ship before they destroy it. You know, and then yeah. he says to him, time time is not on your side like he just he just comes down on on cisco and so right away you're like uh i don't think you're going to be able to sell this guy (laughs) like that's what i was thinking like how are you going to sell this guy on you know turning on the jemadar that he's now which is the same you know cause of his arrogance right to some degree so i don't see how you can turn he would be convinced to turn um yeah, he's convinced that the Federation is right on the brink of falling. Yeah. So he's like, yes, I don't really care what you say because you're you're already defeated in my mind. You're done. It's over for you. So yes. I don't need to jump on your side. I don't want to be a part of anything. You know, I'm gloating and, you know, watching your final gasping yes. attempt at survival. Even though Cisco made a great point, I thought it was a great point. It was, um, oh, it was a point that I've heard made before. And I, I, I just recently heard this point. This is the point. Uh, Cisco says to uh, the senator, what's his name? Vrenak. 
Vrenak. He says to Senator Vrenak, he says, um, now, you know, now you're under a situation where you have to deal with diplomatically three different people who have various different interests and their own separate agendas. That was very good. Yeah. Right? And this is this is a kind of a, a general political idea that can be kind of used in anywhere at any time in, in the world, especially now. When you're dealing with di diplomatically with three different nations or three different countries that have several interests, you spread out the, you know, there's a checks and balances there. It's like, well, you mm -hmm. need that country for this and we need you for that and they need them for this and and you you get you use our money and we use this and we share these common interests. And so the 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 delicacy of diplomacy and and the uh, the nature of the fragility of the relationship. Uh, allows for you know this give and take, this push and pull, this diplomatic uh, cooperation between nations. When it comes to the point that you're dealing with a monolithic, all-powerful type of entity, country, power, nation, um, or in this case, the Dominion, he presents the idea to the Romulans that you realize now you have only one person that you're dealing with as opposed to the three varied things. And, you know, we can have, you know, if you don't want to work with me, I'll find somebody else to work with. Totally. You can't have that option with the Dominion. If they, it's their way or the highway and they're, you know, or you just get annihilated. So I think that was a very valid point about not only uh, the Dominion and, and, and what the Romulans were facing in, in the near future, but it's also a valid point about, governments in general and how uh, war and, 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 and international diplomatic um, relations work. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. I mean, you, when you've got multiple countries kind of keeping each other honest, you know, they're all kind of keeping each other in check because if one screws up, then the others can kind of put them in check theoretically. But yeah, I mean, if you just have that one big powerful thing, that's above everybody and you're surrounded by it, you only suddenly your options have been dwindled down to two acquiesce or be destroyed. <laughs> those are your, those are your two, you have two options now, but before right. you had multiple options. Now you have right. one. Um, and it's, you know, they're neither is good. Uh, I did look up Freenak. Uh, the actor's name is Stephen McHattie. And he doesn't do voiceover, shockingly. But I mean, I guess he's a good enough actor to where he's like, well, I, I do voiceover in person, okay? <laughs> he's done over, he's got <laughs> over 200 credits. He had four episodes in Seinfeld, kind of surprisingly to me. I was like, I don't remember him. He played like a yeah. doctor. What was it? Uh, where'd it go? Doctor something, Dr. Reston. But then I also assumed he might have been in Star Trek somewhere else. And he was in Star Trek Enterprise as well as a Zindi foreman, or he was an alien foreman in the Zindi. Seems like a pretty small, smaller role. So that's basically it. Everything else, I, I feel like this is a guy, man, that he could play in Star Trek over and over and over again as different kinds of aliens. He seems like he's such a good character actor. Yes, um, he was fantastic in this. And like I say, I want to go back to uh, Andrew Robinson a little bit because I thought uh, it's just he was just exceptional. Like there were just moments there where I thought this guy is amazing. And um, one of them was when in the beginning, when he comes to Cisco and he tells Cisco, it may be a very messy and very <laughs> business. Are you prepared for that? You know, like he, he asked him, like, it might get messy and very bloody, right? Mm -hmm. Are you prepared for that? And, and then Cisco says, I'm already in the middle of a messy and bloody situation. Right. I'm so, you know, I'm tired of posting these casualty, uh, this every day so Friday, yes yeah. I'm, I'm prepared for that um and and then the other thing was it was it was garrick who essentially came up with the whole idea so if cisco is going to get credit for saving the alpha quadrant then garrick also deserves credit because 
he manufactured the entire thing, like the whole man. You know, let, let's let's fabricate a video mm-hmm. on the data rods. Those were all his ideas. Get the senator the, to come in the first place, right? Yeah. His idea. Um, even the people who were able to to replicate a data rod, his people, right? You got to bail this guy you know, out of jail. You got to give this guy some biogenetic. So there was, there were, there was all his ideas. He was the chef in the kitchen, just mixing it up. And essentially, Cisco just gives him carte blanche and says, "Yeah, exactly. Whatever, whatever you got to do to get it done, do it." I'm giving you the authority. That's it. This is this is full scale, all out. This is you know we're we're facing extermination here if we don't do something about it. Mm-hmm. So that's th- that's where you hear Cisco say to uh, the camera or to uh, to us. He says, uh, "My father always said." And there were a few "My father always said" moments in this one, which I also mm-hmm. like because that's a that's, nam for Joseph. That's a nam for Joseph. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I just Mm -hmm. laid the first stone. Right. Um, But Cisco says, I pay any price, go to any lengths because my cause was righteous. My intentions were good. That is the rationale used to execute these kinds of things. It's the rationale used for all bad things that happen practically where they say (laughs) they, 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 rationalize it they they reason with themselves and convince themselves well it's because of this or it's because of that whether it's something small like a little white lie you know so he doesn't find out whatever or whether it's you know invading a country you know like this is the thing and that's and what's cool about it is usually these people are convincing themselves they're gaslighting themselves um or they're justifying it to themselves cisco does that but he's he's aware of it he knows he's not he's not some delusional person that has skewed rationality he's he's aware he and that's where the real guilt comes in that's where that's where he's saying yeah i know what i did is bad i know yeah. that what i'm telling myself to justify this is basically based on the ends justifying the means not because in any way I think what I'm doing is right. And that's where that monologue at the end comes in, where he says, he's, he says, I can live with that. And he says it twice just to make sure we really get it. And so to make sure he really gets it, he realizes that he did something very bad. And he realizes that there's kind of no coming back from that in a lot of ways, morally speaking, but he can live with it based on the past, based on the present and based on what he believes the future would have been. Yes. And, and um, so he earns the respect of Garrick because Garrick sees now that he's, he's unscrupulous, <laughs> right? And he, he, he loves the fact that he's got Cisco's wheels turning and that he, yeah. he might, he's willing to do anything because that's what Garrick was like. The other person that was very impressed was Quark. Quark says, oh, God, I'm like, I'm like rule of acquisition number 98. We finally every got another one, yeah. Right? It's been a while. Every, every man has his price. And, and so Quark is so elated that, you know, Cisco is about to bribe him, right? right? You're, you're breaking the law, a bribe? You know, like, yeah. whoa, you're impressing me, right? You must really need this. Okay. And I, he I, went I like easy that. on him too. Because you'll Kinda, notice yes, when yes. Cisco said anything else. Is that it? Yeah. Quark said, no, that's good. I think we've got ourselves a bribe. I'm like, wow, how very unferengi yeah. of him. If somebody yes. says anything else to a Ferengi, yes. they'd be like, oh, now that you mention it, uh, maybe, you know, they're <laughs> yeah. just really get whatever they can. But he was just so happy and elated about it. He's like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and the moment I like too is when he says, I'm estimating how much I lost for the day, five bars of gold left. And then he says, There's this other thing, you know, I got this stuff in cargo and it needs like a license or something. Yeah, something. Who cares? <laughs> it's just goes like, I'll take care of it. I love that. 
that moment too, I thought it was just brief, but it just was a great uh, Cork Cisco moment. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you, you were mentioning um, kind of that last scene with Cisco, you know, and, and that whole uh, scene that's behind you with the glass of whatever it is that he was going to essentially, he says, it's, you know, this is a huge victory for the good guys. And he raises his glass up, you know, mm -hmm. and then he goes on to say he can live with it. Yeah. He says, I, 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 yeah, he says, Please. so I lied. I cheated. I bribed men to cover the crimes of other men. I am an accessory to murder, but most damning thing of all, I think I can live with it. And if I had to do it all over again, I would. Garrick was right about one thing. A guilty conscience is a small price to pay for the safety of the Alpha Quadrant. So I will learn to live with it because I can live with it. I can live with it. And then he says, of course, computer, erase that entire personal law. He's like, ah, whew, I feel better. I got, got off my chest. Now get that shit out of here so nobody will ever see it or hear it. Yeah, and, uh, and that was an A++ moment. And I, I, I'm going to say some of the subtle things that I think he did in his performance that I admired, uh, you know, watching him do. One of, was, one of them was the way he held this glass up and kept about to take a sip of it. Like he kept, mm. there were moments where he was going to take a sip. And, and if you take this sip, then you've ended the thought, right? And you've satisfied. So you would take that sip, but he never takes a sip of this drink. So he never really is satisfied because, yes. you know, he makes, you know, you make a toast. Normally you say, Hey, this is the cheers to the bachelor to the, my best friend or, you know, congratulations. And then everybody's cheers, And then you take, take a sip. And here are the cheers is to the huge victory to the good guys, right? We've accomplished it. We made it happen. And he's about to take the sip, but he, he doesn't. And he goes on and he's, and he says, but I did, I'm all right with it. And he's about to take the sip. And then, he, and then he puts it down that that's not completing the gesture of making a toast and taking a sip and completing it. It means that he is still wrestling uh, with it wrestling with it and it's eating at him right he can't put that finalization on it with the you know all right forget it it's over but that's a great observation that, by the way yeah that that was one thing he did in the performance never took a sip always about to he almost does and then he at the end he's like ah, puts it down and he says i can live with it right and and then he says this is the final thing in the performance not the final but one of the other things i want to point out he crosses his legs and puts his arm over the sofa when he says, I can live with it the second time. And it's almost like he's trying to just be relaxed, right? He's trying to convince <laughs> himself yeah. to be okay yeah. with it. Yeah. Right. So even in the body language, he that's his like, I can live with it body language. He puts the drink down. He's sitting forward, sets the drink down, leans back like I can live with it. Right. You know, and he puts crosses his leg over. Yeah. yeah. You know, he's like, no, no, I'm like, good. I'm, I'm cool, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. I could do it, <laughs> right? And and then he's like, computer, no, end the program, right? I can't, you know, I'm gonna just try to forget about this. But I just love that body language there, the crossing in the legs, putting up his arm, beautiful you know, details, I can, yeah, just small things in his performance, not drinking the drink, and and obviously inflections in his voice, and just you know the way he looks at the camera and the and the looks he gives. Um, excellent. A, I just kept writing A plus plus. I felt like I was grading a paper. Uh, <laughs> Garrick Garrick says, "Always a pleasure to see you, Mister Worf." <laughs> and and Worf looks. Worf's at him look like, was priceless. He's like, "Who the? What are you doing with Cisco?" Are you joking? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, "No big deal. Me and Cisco are going to go, you know, tend to some business. You just stay there and look tough." Yeah. <laughs> Always a pleasure to see you now that I'm in charge. Oh, right yeah. now I'm in charge. <laughs> so there was there was that other point that I, I kind of wanted to bring up a bit, which is what they did was is called a false flag, right? They created a, a, a fake situation or a fake attack or something to bring mm -hmm. in a, a war or to bring you know to to make a side react the way that they want it to react and yes i thought it was really interesting how they how they did that and you know those of us that know history know that this is a a tried and true method 
Um, and, you know, maybe the worst offender of false flags is our very own United States of America. <laughs> I think, I think possibly we, we can all admit, yeah, I mean, hey, you know, history, you know, who knows, but I thought it was really interesting that, you know, again, Star Trek brings things that have happened and do happen in real life and they display them, you know, into an episode for us all to watch, to understand the reasoning behind it, to come up with our own opinions of it and to look at it from a third person point of view rather than on one side or the other. And I thought that they did a really, you know, masterful job of doing that, of seeing, you know, why do people do these kinds of things? And it's terrible. It's horrible. We all know it. We all acknowledge it. Yet somehow when we're watching this thing, we're like, it's cool, Cisco. <laughs> I, I, I'm glad you did it. Yeah. You know, like I'm, I'm good with it. And it's just, that's what's just so powerful about it is that, again, that Cisco is very cognizant of what he did. He has not fooled himself in any way. He knows that he is, you know, danced with the devil in the pale moonlight, which is where I think Michael Taylor said the quote came from uh, Batman, um, whatever, with the, the Joker said that in the Batman movie. Have you ever danced with the devil in the pale moonlight? So he danced with the devil and, and he can live with it. He's like, yeah, well, I got to make tough decisions sometimes. And this is the one that I think was the right decision. Yeah. You know, and that's what Star Trek does. It makes you, it takes what's right and wrong and puts it in a space where it don't, no longer has the same easy, discernible right and wrong about right. it. Right. It, it's like, normally you're like, Oh, that's wrong. That's right. You know, kill somebody that's wrong. You know, save somebody's life. That's right. That's you know, good. Normally, <laughs> right. Normally those are very distinguishable, right? Somebody drowning in a pool, you jump in, you save their life. That's the right thing to do. And you know, you're a hero for that. But then there's these gray areas and you're like, well, if somebody's drowning in the pool, but they're also a rapist and they, and you're <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> you know, you start to, they, they put you in that space where you're like, what is right? Is that right? Is that wrong? You know, and you start to question what you would normally um, be easy to discern. And I think that's what um, the writers here do such an excellent job of. They make these very complicated things, these very delicate, questionable things where you're like, um, and you mentioned it earlier where the last interview, uh, last episode we reviewed talked about the ends justifying the means, like killing people in order to save people, right? We have to kill these people to save these people. And that's essentially what we have here. We have to kill these people to save these people, right? And um, when you think about killing people, you're like, well, that's wrong. Killing people is wrong. It's just not right. But how many people are you saving and, and, and to what extent are we, you know, uh, is the course of history going to change because of, you know, these, these certain set of actions that are about to unfold. So they, they put you in this spot as the viewer where you, you uh, are, are just really pressed to find what is right and wrong. And, and, you know, like you said, at the end, I felt like, you know, Cisco, don't worry. I got you back. Even Garrick. I'm like, you know, I, oh, Garrick's like, I in forget. love with him now. Garrick's like, oh, yeah. that's my oh, boy. Yeah. And if he ever but does anything Garrick, bad, I, I got I, shit on him so bad. I got I got oh, blackmail yeah, on him. So does Quark. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so does Quark. Yeah. But no, Garrick is like, um, but so does Garrick in the way that I mean, you know, I forgive him too. Right. Because Garrick is responsible for some of this. You know, he he planted a bomb that killed this guy. And the same forgiveness or whatever that you extend to Cisco, you would extend to Garrick as well. Right. Right. I feel because like it's he, even easier for Garrick because he we all know who he is. You know what I mean? He's never sworn some oath to, like, protect people. <laughs> he's right, like, right. He's taking care <laughs> of number one, baby. Right. He's like. <laughs> He's like, hey, I don't want this station to blow up. I don't want the Federation to go under. So I'm going to yeah. figure something out. And another example of that was I thought was great in the uh, when they were in the turbo lift 
And Cisco tells Gar- uh, Garrick tells Cisco, yeah, I have a source, but he needs 200 liters of that uh, biomimetic gel. And mm-hmm. Cisco's like, forget about it. And then he's like, 200 is too much. Yes. Because and, he was like, he's like, no he, way, no how, yeah, no way, forget no it. Way. And then he says, yeah. ops, go to ops. And then he's like, yeah. halt. And, he's, and he like rethinks it. And he's like, that's too much. <laughs> like, but yeah. for a second, he drew the line. He's like, nope, I'm not going to do it. But nope. But then a few seconds later, he's like, okay, well, let, let's, let's talk about this. And then Garrick says the line, something like, well, I believe the amount can be up for negotiation. And then yes. it ended up being 85 you, instead of 200. I believe. Which is just great writing right there. You know, shout out to Michael Taylor. Yeah. Uh, the right, that's beautiful writing right there because it's like 200 is too much. Like, you know, it's like, yeah, what does he want? He wants a nuclear bomb. <laughs> you know, he can't have a nuclear bomb. But, uh, you know, give him half of just, one. <laughs> does he need a bomb? <laughs> like, does he just need a bomb? You know, yeah. okay, well, you can give him a bomb, but he can't have a nuclear bomb. It's basically like it was a compromise, right? And, but it was also showed me that. Garrick, even though he's doing this, he, he he didn't negotiate it down, right? Originally, he went. He the guy says, "I want 200 and Garrick's like, "All right, two hundred, whatever you say." You know, it's like so. So, in, in that point, is just to say that you know when he says, "I think it's negotiable," it shows you that Garrick had, leaves room for those things. Like totally. he wouldn't have revealed. He wouldn't have revealed that it was negotiable. Maybe he would have said, okay, Cisco said 200, but now I'll negotiate with the guy and get him down 85 and I'll keep 115 for myself for somebody else. So all we that's know, how devious Garrick is. Right. right, right. For we, all we, we know, know he's, but, maybe the guy asked right. for 85 in the first place and Garrick's like, he'll never go for that. But maybe if I ask him for 200, <laughs> you know, he's, all, you never exactly. know, he's always playing exactly. that fiddle, man. Um, exactly. we do have to hop into our free for all. I'm sure there's gonna be way more to talk about still. Um, have got to give a very special thanks to our friends, Carmen, AKA skillet, skillet, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, really? Phil Victor, you know, it Arukin, Arukin, Yvette Blackman, Tom Homer Freezy out somewhere in New Yeezy, Eve England Easy. out in Wales, Dr. Anne Marie Siegel, Titus Doctor. Muller. Tim Baum, Darlene Murray, John Mann, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Joe Balserati, Tierney Joe Balserati. C. Diekman, Michelle Melendez, Marsha Classic Schreier, Anna Post, Jenna Appleton, Dr. Frank Sobozhensky. I hope I'm saying that right because I'm so proud of saying it, but I'm going to find out. Yeah. Later. <laughs> and of course, Dr. Susan V. Gruner in. Northern Florida. All right, everybody, stick around for the free for all. We got a lot more to talk about, and we'll be right back on the seventh rule. Hey, everybody, guess what? We've returned on the seventh rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. <laughs> That's a nice little horn honk right on cue there. I don't know if you guys heard that. Uh, we are joined by Eve England out in Wales, of course, Tim Baum out in Fiji, Melissa Longo with Brinac. We've got on a post, Tierney C. Diekman. We've got Galdu Scott, of course, with his rad shirt. We have Homer Freezy in Manhattan. And uh, Darlena <laughs> Marie Blander. How you guys doing? Ooh, pretty good, man. All right. Mm-hmm. So this is a big good. one. Yeah. So first things first, you guys. Jake Sisko guesses the IMDb score. No spoilers. <laughs> oh, man. This was... This is the first, I, I don't know, this is not the first time, but this is damn near perfect 10 episode. Um, but I know that they don't give out perfect 10s. I'm going to say a 9.5. Wow. Does anybody else have a guess that doesn't know what it happens to be on IMDb? Well, everybody knows. Definitely. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead look, yeah. it. I don't idea. remember. I think it'll be a bit lower than that. You know, I think it deserves that. Maybe 9.1. Possibly. Um, yeah, 
two nine point four. It was it was it was high. Say nine point two. I don't know. Sirach, I think that's the highest you've ever guessed. I think that is easily the highest you've ever said, 9.5. Well, if I remember correctly, and I can go confirm, but I do believe it is, in fact, a 9.5 Sirach Lofton. Oh, wow. <laughs> Which wow. makes it the yep. highest rated Star Trek episode ever. Melissa's wow. like, even Discovery? Yep. <laughs> Highest rated ever. ever. Higher than Ephraim and Dot? Yep. Higher than Spock's brain? Wow. Higher than Spock's brain. Oh. Pretty yeah, awesome. it's that's pretty damn good. It's 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 everything you want about Star Trek. I mean, with all the conflict. Oof. It's it's rich. This is a rich episode. Yep. 9.5. There There's is. no wasted moments. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody's like just they're like everybody seems to be like this, like, shut up, I have stuff to say. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. 9.5. It's really good. Uh well, Eve, what are your thoughts on this episode? Do you have any fun gems to share? Was was this just as good the most recent time you watched it as all the others, or does it get better with time? Yeah, because again, I just tend to forget what happens. Um, so I'm just kind of <laughs> me, like watching them for the first time. So, I mean, I, again, I read The Companion first just in case there were some interesting things to just look out for. And actually what, what they did say is obviously this is the first time, or I think they said it's the first time that we have, you know, the fourth wall being broken and we're actually having Cisco talking to us. Um, so what they had to do, they actually shot it in sequence. So because they said it was just so essential that they had it so that each of the scenes mirrored and completely seamlessly matched up with each of the Cisco monologue scenes. They had to do it in sequence otherwise, because they just wouldn't have been able to do it on the editing side. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And I, I think, because I have to say with the IMDb score, in some way I was thinking, okay, well, I, I would definitely give it a really high score. But then I was thinking, I know that a lot of Star Trek fans don't always like when Deep Space Nine does something a bit darker. But I think the fact that they use that the way that they presented it with Cisco basically talking to us very honestly about how he's coming to terms with the fact that he has done something that he, you know, thought he would never ever do and is completely against what he believes in, I think just can help convince the audience that, you know, they're not really going against the, the Roddenberry ideals mm -hmm. in, in that respect because he is, he's got such conflict within him doing this and he, you know, although he says he would do it again, he's clearly not really very comfortable with that situation. So I think that the, that decision they made to have Cisco talking directly at us, albeit via the log, I think was a really good way of positioning that as opposed to the way that we saw section 31 last week. Mm, and I thought it was right. quite interesting. So I was like, well, what, what, would Cisco have been influenced by the fact that he now knows about that? And could he have made a different decision had he never experienced or ever been introduced to them. So yeah, I, I just think that the way that they they did that was a, a good way of, of getting the audience on side because they can really see that struggle with, with this horrendous situation he finds himself in because he knows he has to save all these lives because, you know, because he can't deal with all those those deaths that he's having to deal with every day. So yeah, and I think mm -hmm. it's fantastic. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Rock was saying that uh the two people that were killed in this um, whatever his name was, Talor or something like that, and Vrenak were kind of unsavory characters to make it a little bit more palatable mm -hmm. for us, the viewers. Yeah, that's true. And that the other three people who died were, you know, Cardassians who were a bit dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Tim Baum, what do you think of this episode? Did you love it or were you like too dark? Oh, I thought it was one of the finest episodes of TV ever. Um, I did have one nitpick and it's not just about this episode or the show, but it's other shows. If I could put the phonetic alphabet up in a writer's room of any show so they get it right. It's not Baker. It's Bravo. Ooh. Ooh. It's not Mark. It's Mike. It's, oh, that just drives me crazy. Uh, <laughs> They're like cadets. Cringe. Um, it changed in a few hundred years. Well, 
Oh, well, better not. You know, it's, been, yeah. it's been stable since 1947, so we'll stick with that. <laughs> so, bravo, bravo, bravo. <laughs> Baker, 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 <laughs> liver most. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I thought it's one of Avery's finest performance. Both him and Andrew made that 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 episode. Uh, the intensity of the monologues. Uh, the one thing that this show evoked, I don't know if if anybody's ever had ethics training or management training. There's two scenarios that they always give you that this episode reminded me of. And the first one was an anecdote that after Pearl Harbor happened, uh, Winston Churchill's reply was, good, they're finally going to join the war. Yeah. Because up until that time, we had stayed out of it. And the other had to do with the, the bombing of Coventry in 44. Uh, they always put you in groups and ask you to discuss what you would do. But the story goes that we had uh, the allies had broken uh, the enigma, the German code. And they found out that uh, the Nazis were going to bomb Coventry in the Midlands. But we were close to planning D-Day. So everybody said, we got to warn Coventry. But then if we warn Coventry, the Germans might figure out that we broke their code. So the decision was made to let the bombing happen in Coventry to preserve the greater good of the war. Um, and, uh, you know, on a side note, my father said to visit to the bombed out Coventry church, which is still there. He said it was one of the most dramatic things he's been to. But that's wow. the story. And then wow. they ask you to get into groups and say, what would you do? Um, and in this case, you know, Cisco knew what he needed to do, but his moral compass didn't allow him to. So and I thought one of the best scenes mm -hmm. is at the very end when he's pounding on Garrick. And Garrick says, I did exactly what you wanted me to. That's what you're mad at. Not what I did, but that you couldn't do it and you had me do it for you. So, mm -hmm. so that's, that's how, uh, you know, I still think it deserves a 9.5 or higher. So, yeah, we also kind of touched on earlier that this is, this theme is not exactly new to militaries or governments of kind of allowing something to happen or making something happen in order to bring some some entity into a war or to get one side onto your side or whatever right yeah that that was the whole coventry thing it's like yeah. you know apparently it's it's not as true as everybody led us to believe but uh i could still see something like that happening especially when they were full into the planning of overlord which was d-day mm -hmm. and you know the germans had changed the code just before d-day that would have really Mm -hmm. been disastrous so right speaking of overlord hey Anne marie siegel has joined us hello <laughs> how are you doing perfect all right uh melissa longo what's new mm. what are your thoughts did you enjoy the shit out of this episode or what <laughs> i really enjoyed this episode i don't know if enjoyed is the right word but it, it because because I was as uncomfortable as Cisco was in this mm. episode. There was so much discomfort from him from beginning to end, even when he's trying to convince himself that he can live with his decision. And so he says it again so that he tries to convince himself that he can live with his decision. So, and in, it was done so well so well um by everyone even this guy yeah he was yeah um wonderful and uh wonderful in that it, it shows a, a a darker side to starfleet that we don't always get to see and um and i think people get disillusioned that starfleet is infallible and that they are above reproach in in most ways that they approach things that everything is altruistic but there's a struggle to get to that enlightened state of you know of peace and 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 we're not just dealing with with the aliens in the federation we're dealing with other aliens who have a different set of moral guidelines that we you know we have to um uh contend with as well so um it, it, this is a wonderful episode to show how difficult leadership is and mm. the the impossible choice that Cisco is 
or position Cisco is in, placed in, um, you know, it, it's either acquiesce to the Dominion and or keep the Alpha Quadrant safe. And and I think even though it's a, a more morally questionable choice that he makes, it, it it's for the greater good, you know, the needs of the many. So, um, so it's really wonderful. And, totally. and the costuming, uh, incredible Garrick's outfits, clothing. Yes. So good. <laughs> impeccable. Yeah. And even Quark's is wonderful. And Greenax's is, is wonderful. It, it, it's costumes in this whole thing were mm. wonderful. And I love the look at in the shuttle bay. When the Romulan shuttle beams into um, to yeah. deep space time, that was pretty neat and um, yeah. And fun little tidbit: this guy right here was in a movie with Aaron called Pterodactyl Woman from Beverly Hills. So. Oh, that old movie! That that's <laughs> a classic. <laughs> yeah, I dated her once. <laughs> oh, pterodactyl lady! It's a basic yeah. true story. Yeah. It's basically a true story. Yeah, but yeah, wow. wonderful, wonderful episode. Wow, yeah, yeah. Garrick looked so good. I put that in my notes too. Yeah. He just, man, I was like, that is my boy right there. He knows how to dress. Yes, uh, he does. Speaking of which, Homer, how are you, bud? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I am well. Um, as to this episode, I agree 9.5 <laughs> is good. Um, I don't know as we've seen this glass before on Deep Space Nine, so it was good prop to use. Uh, I, I like Cisco's progression, um, the way that they told the story, as in, you know, he starts out completely composed and, and fully uniformed. And towards the end, he's a bit more casual. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know as I have a whole lot to add beyond what has been said already. It's a fantastic episode. Oh, yeah. I do have one thing. It was just more of a question for, for everyone here. And maybe it, we don't have time for it. But could you see another starship captain doing the same Ooh. thing? Janeway. Good question. Yeah. yeah. Would Janeway? Janeway, Janeway has done would. some kind of sketchy yeah. stuff in the past, right? Oh, and he yeah. also had uh, Archer. <laughs> Archer kind of left some guys high and dry during the Zindi Wars, right? Yeah. What do you guys think? I don't know. I think Janeway was too much of a stickler for the rules. Um, I could Anna see Kirk disagrees. doing it. I, I can see Jacolti. There were a couple ones with Janeway where... Um, she did bend the rules, I think. Probably like, not to this degree, I think. Lorca. Maybe not. To this <laughs> Lorca. <laughs> he would do it without Level a second thought. Yeah. Because this is this is entirely illegal. Is I mean, what they do is it's horrendous. Yeah. It's not like they just let something slide, or you know, it's he goes out to do Lorca. that. Um, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a war crime. So, war crime. Um, <laughs> well, here in America, we don't think it's that bad. It's tomato, tomato, you know. That's a good question, Homer. We could talk mm -hmm. about that forever. <laughs> good well, question, uh, Darlena Marie. Welcome back. So good to see you. Have you seen this Hi. episode recently? And if so, did you love it? Yes, I I think when I watched it, um, when I got the email that we, we were going to be talking about it, I watched it. I think that was my 18th and 19th time watching it. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. I watched so much DS9. Um, I remember watching this with my mom, and she had a she had a real big issue with Cisco being put in that situation. She uh, she did the opposite to what Homer just said. She honestly felt that no other captain would have been placed in that kind of situation. And she was very upset that Cisco was. Um, oh. She, yeah, to me is a, is a real dichotomy. He's kind of his own protagonist and antagonist at the same time. And uh, it is a big quandary yeah. and um, that he was in. And then there's a question as 
could have been done some other way because something else had been done. But what I love about it is what I've heard um, Melissa and the others state that the dark aspect of it and this whole belief that Starfleet is so prim and proper and, you know, we just wouldn't do certain things. Um, but then it goes back to the need for Section 31 and the need to sometimes do Section 31 type things. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> this was totally... <laughs> A S31 type of thing. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of what, what I find enjoyable about it, because I like to do the darkness, you know, along with the um <laughs> the purity, is I like how um we there's an aspect of, of us that's willing to as much as we may come against and when I say we I mean Starfleet, as much as we may have some issues with S31 and how they operate, we all have that little S31 inside of us when necessary to let it <laughs> out. <laughs> You're so right. that, that's kind of right. how I look at this episode. Like, oh, he, he got that little S31 inside of him. He just had to let it out, you know, uh, kind of indirectly. But, you know, still the mindset was there. So and this is what I love about DS9, because it just it breaks through this whole puritanical um, mindset mm -hmm. of how we are in Starfleet. And, it, you know, we we. We say we're enlightened and we're we operate on the higher plane and everything like that of integrity. But then it goes back to the question, what are we willing to do to hold on to what we have? Mm. It, it, sometimes it just goes back to that 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 the crux of the human nature, <laughs> survival of the fittest and survival at any cost, you know. So that's what I pulled from this episode. That's what I really, really love about it. And I definitely, yeah, I agree the nine point five is great. It was a good melodrama and you know the production design was great the outfits was great but the intensity of the story and the acting mm. and the way it just throws you aback you're like what he did what you know that kind <laughs> <of thing. laughs> and that's what i love about this episode in episodes that are written like this you know so yeah i i, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy this episode every time i see it I loved it when you said, we all got a little Section 31 in us, right, guys? And everyone's like, eh, eh, eh. Melissa's like, oh. nope, not me. <laughs> Definitely do. Scott does, yeah, for sure. Not at all. <laughs> um, on a post, uh, yeah. you are the poster child for Section 31. So <laughs> everybody knows it. You're like, at all costs. Oh. Doesn't I like matter. dark things. They match my soul. <laughs> oh. um, I I really love this episode. I have so many thoughts on it. Um, I mean, first off, I really kind of like the almost journaling is self therapy because he was mm. never he was never going to keep yeah. that Good for the record. Point. That was just yeah. him as a way to work out what had happened and work out what he was doing. And I like that idea that we do like, we do need to do that, like work through our own issues sometimes. And he's not going to take this to a therapist, but he's still going to work through it the way he can. Mm -hmm. um, and so many people do use that um, self-reflection to work through things. So I kind of like that on one note. Um, I love the fact that that it is darker because it is easy to find hope and joy in the future and optimism in a utopian society. It is more poignant to find hope and optimism in something that isn't quite as perfect. Yeah. Um, so I think mm -hmm. when it is a little bit darker and you are striving to be better, it's a little bit more poignant. Um, so I, I always liked the darker aspect of DS9. Um, for the whole situation that Cisco is put in, I mean, he, Starfleet sanctioned it. And in his brain, Starfleet would never do that. But Starfleet knew where this was going. Like Starfleet sanctioned it and approved it, which kind of surprised Cisco, but it's great. And and. Garrick knew where this was going. Do we know for sure that they did, or that maybe he was just saying that to get well, Bashir to do it? I'm assuming like the plan, maybe not all of the pieces of the plan, but the overall plan, Starfleet sanctioned. And I'm assuming because Starfleet has intelligence and security that they mm. know things can go sideways you know what they didn't tell him not to do something they said yes <laughs> we need to do this you know what i mean and they they left fitting the pieces as probably a cover 
um, because no one's going to say, yes, do this horrible thing. They'd be like, yes, this needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Go at it. Um, and Bash yeah. And Bashir and I, did yeah. say that I'm going to file this in my yep. exactly. file. Officially, this yeah. Officially. Mm -hmm. So Cisco wouldn't yeah. have said, go ahead, if they didn't already know yeah. stuff was up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the Cardassians would do something like this. Um, you know, Garrick says the Tal Shear will believe it because it is what they would do. Yeah. Romulans you know, the, the would Romulans do would do yes. something like this. And I think Cisco was kind of hoping or holding on to that, that Starfleet was better than that and Starfleet wouldn't, but this proves that Starfleet would. Like there aren't they really aren't that different, you know, in some aspects. Like they will all go to that place to get what they need sometimes. Um, there's that really thin line between what you think you're willing to do and what you are. Um, mm -hmm. And I always wonder if that's part of what is so hard with Cisco coming to terms with is not just what he ended up doing. And, you know, he, I don't think he realized that Garrick was going to blow up that shuttle. Like he mm -hmm. was instrumental in that happening, but even he maybe had been, telling himself it wouldn't go that extra thing mm. like he had done all he could but but not just that he went there but the organization that he believed so much in was willing to go there as well mm -hmm. you know that's funny that you mentioned that he was just kind of talking talking it out to himself mm -hmm. it's kind of like if you uh when you uh type out an email or a text and you're really venting but then you mm -hmm. accidentally hit send. What if you accidentally hit send instead of delete? You would yes. <laughs> Tyranny. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Go ahead. Was there something else? Me? Oh, I was just going to say, I love that subtle difference between those last two. I can live with this. And yeah. then you hear the change of his inflections. And he's like, I can live with this. Where he, he gets that. No, I'm, I am okay with this. Like this got done and then he deletes the log. And I just, I just loved that subtle difference in the line reading. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Tierney, have you ever hit send by accident? Probably. <laughs> Any thoughts on this episode or were you like, that's, oh. that's another Melora. <laughs> <laughs> what is it with you and Melora? <laughs> Meridian. Ooh. Meridian. <laughs> Okay, so um, I have I have other notes, but I'm going to touch on something that was in kind of my secondhand notes that I'm not sure I might be just making assumptions based on body language, but I think I think Tim might kind of understand this one and get in on it too, go it off of um, something that you were saying Anna, on um, and a few of these points of. Uh, Starfleet and the Federation and these reports and Bashir's, um, you know, complaint to Starfleet Medical, et cetera, and so forth. One thing that I love, love, maybe, you know, I don't know if I love it, but it's just, it makes it more believable, relatable about this episode. Same thing with, this is my number two favorite. Number one is Far Beyond the Stars, uh, is that they really deal with more real life uh, and relatable issues. Mm -hmm. This one is very real life to me and probably to Tim as well because of dealing with the Navy. Um, mm -hmm. My husband's been in for over 10 years, uh, very similar rate to, to Tim. We've dealt with this for so long. Mm -hmm. um, and oh my God, <laughs> this way of handling things is so real oh it's so real that conversation that he has with with Bashir I'm not asking you I'm ordering you I'm sure you wanted this in writing you go ahead and complain mm -hmm. they don't care <laughs> I can guarantee you nobody's looking at this complaint given the situation and gives a damn uh, they're going to glance Tim at is it. loving every second of this tyranny, by the way. Because he right knows. Now. <laughs> he absolutely knows. It's all this the stuff that came works. out with like the um, airstrikes mm -hmm. and the whole watch. This uh, is how it thing that nobody ever looked at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my 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 husband spent five and a half years of you know 
over a decade of marriage, mostly deployed. And we've, we know how this works and that Starfleet approved of the plan. If they're Federation or not, this is, the Federation is built off of a utopian ideal from a almost literal scorched earth after World War III. I mean, everybody's hurting, everybody's PTSD paranoid that it's going to happen again. We have Section 31 to prevent it from happening again. There are there are dirty deeds done dirt cheap, as I have said before, dimes for crimes <laughs> happening all over the place to keep this from occurring again. Things are swept under all of them gray rugs, and it is not pretty. If every detail is in that report, which I'd like to hope it is in this future, that if it comes out, if if it's watergated, that we would take full responsibility. But the chances of all those details in that report in a wartime on, well, a final frontier out in the Bajoran Bufu, they're no, they're not in that report. And if they are, they're getting passed off. Nobody cares. This needs to happen. This is an entire quadrant that's trying to commit genocide against the Federation Starfleet, all of these plants, and they just invaded Beta Z. Mm-hmm. No, nah, nobody, nobody cares. Um, is at least my opinion based on realism of the fact. Like, look at all the details of what Garrick is doing. I mean, Vrenak is vice chairman of the Tal Shiar. He is a trusted advisor of Neral, who tried to overthrow reunification with Spock and Picard and, and, and Data. This is not a great guy to deal with. He should have, Cisco should have known off the bat if he did any research into Vrenak, which I would hope he'd at least look at a pad about this guy with, you know, a quick bio, that it would definitely be in Garrick's interest in Cardassia Obsidian Order. He knows he's got contacts to get rid of him. But in this case, Cisco isn't naive. He just doesn't have the luxury to care to ask for details. He doesn't ask for details that we know of who, what Grayson Tolar did that he's in a Klingon prison. He doesn't want to has- know. No, he doesn't want to know because he doesn't, again, have the luxury or the time to care. This is too important. He knows he's getting in deep and he feels like, crap about it i mean look at what garrick's gonna do Vrenak's gonna come in he's gonna plunder a ship for all the little espionage tchotchkes he can get out of it like all of this is in garrick's best interest do we know that he's gonna burn all of his resources on cardassia for that bs i don't believe that he's got plenty of resources how the hell does he know that Vrenak is going to sakara where is that information coming from does everybody he wants to talk to get killed possibly probably does cisco ask about that no he doesn't know he just casually gets told this in garrick's tailor shop i mean this is this is garrick's episode and one of his one of his mm-hmm. best i mean and this is this is a lot of good performances even that little bit with cork with the bribe it's so smooth and it's it's beautiful but you know we then we we get to this this point at uh the the culmination of all of this and we kind of love seeing our protagonists get you know into that almost villainous role we kind of love villains in this group the fictional villains are a little sexy we're we're sort of into that real life villains not so much but fictional it's good we see our beloved captain one of the best most in a way most realistic captains in Star Trek get to this point and it's kind of perfection. It pushes all the boundaries. We see this utopia of Star Trek that all of us are going, we love you, Gene Roddenberry, but this is almost the most unbelievable part of the series in a way, regardless of transporters. And it's fantastic. And that last line, I can live with it. Mm. And to me, at least, it's not I can live with it. It's I have to live with it. 
and it just ends it beautifully. Mm-hmm. It's it's wonderful all around. Love it. It's mm-hmm. amazing. And great necklace, by the way. That's really cool. Klingon. Thank necklace. you. This is a this is one of my new one of my new prototypes. Hopefully, I can eventually make enough of these that other people can have. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Goldu Scott, do you have a cool necklace to show? Don't. Just an awesome shirt. Sure. And it uh, looks like an yeah, Islanders so. hat. Yeah, I'm not a very right. awesome team, but I love them. Um, <laughs> 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 I, uh, I I think it's really cool the question that Homer asked because it was what I was already thinking of uh, when thinking of what I wanted to talk about with this episode. And that was, you know, what other captains could make this yeah. decision. And... You know, uh, this this particular episode is really what puts Captain Cisco as my favorite captain in Star Trek, because not only does he sacrifice, I mean, every one of these captains would 100 percent sacrifice their life for their entire crew and for the Alpha Quadrant and for everything and this and that. But Cisco sacrificed a part of his soul for this to make this decision. And it wasn't just for the. Um, for, for, to, to save the lofty ideals of the Federation or to save, you know, the, uh, all the good that they built, but it was just to literally save lives because I do not think the Dominion would have left Earth and Vulcan alone. They would have went and just leveled all of it. I don't think that they would have let any of the, the founding uh, Federation seats survive afterwards. So, um, yeah, this definitely puts, because Cisco does what I don't think anybody else could have done in this situation. And... My and my question, actually, I have a question for Sarak with all of this, is that Jake being the journalist that he is, particularly at this point, and that eventually he's gonna find out about what Ben had to do in this situation. How do you feel that Jake at this age, at this time in the show, would feel about uh the decision that his dad had to make? Spicy when he did find out. Mm, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, he, because of his, uh, because that he, he doesn't have as much experience as his father in these kinds of situations, I think he would probably be more judgmental about, about what his actions were, uh, to the point where, you know, it would cause a big rift and conflict between the two of them. I could I think Jake is 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 idealistic in his approach about the world and you know wants things to be right or wrong and and have you know clear cut explanations as a writer and I think that this may question uh his morality and his and and his 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 father's use of judgment in some way because he doesn't have the kind of long term experience that Cisco has where he has seen certain outcomes and and has to take those kinds of things into into play it's it's kind of the usual generational you know the younger generation kind of rebelling against their parents generation and mm-hmm. and finding you're not cool anymore and you think in this way and that's that's outdated and we could have done this diplomatically there's, there's other ways i think it would have been kind of a that kind of a conversation between the two of them i just i actually the companion actually says that um the script originated with jake uncovering something that was going on um and then it moved to him actually challenging cisco to do this and it's interesting Mm -hmm. you said that because that's exactly why they then moved away from that because they said it just the conflict between the two didn't quite give it the same edge that it needed because jake was still relatively inexperienced in life generally mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. so yeah that is really interesting wow that's really cool mm-hmm. good question scott as always no. uh Anne marie are you still rebelling against your parents or are you past that phase <laughs> <laughs> you think they're cool now uh, they suddenly my, became cool my mom is a <laughs> <laughs> he's in the live chat right now I am. okay <laughs> <laughs> no um yeah no i'm not rebelling do you have any thoughts on this i'm actually I'm, sorry i was just texting with my dad <laughs> <laughs> be like mom is being so yeah. weird right now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um no i love i mean obviously it's amazing and i am obsessed with goldie scott's t-shirt because i love garrick's merch yes. 
And um, yeah, I don't know. It's a good one. There's nothing really to say like that everybody hasn't already covered. It's it's wonderful. Did you tend it? Like of David? Course. Nice. Of course. David tended to. <laughs> Hilarious. Best episode ever. Here, well, here's the weird thing. I really love like the little hidden gems a lot, and I love Ferengi episodes and stuff. So like I love this episode, but it's not one of my personal favorites, even though it just it just doesn't need my love because it has enough love. <laughs> <laughs> She's an underdog lover. Yeah. She goes for the underdog story. All right. Well, we gotta run everybody. Uh, but thank you all so much for joining us. Keep the uh conversation going well, can we in say the comments. Computer below. Del- erase. Yeah, that's that's what Homer <laughs> said at the beginning. He said, "Are you gonna, are you gonna delete? Uh, the, are you gonna have the computer delete this afterwards? We'll see if I hit the wrong button." Mm-hmm. All right, I can live with that. I had a really quick thing, real fast. Um, the blue alien that's doing the uh, replicating of this yeah. information and forging. Don't it. know what kind of alien yeah. it was. Yeah, he reminded me of a blue version of the Grinch, of Jim Carrey's version of the Grinch. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Uh, so when you watch it again, if, if you can think of the blue Grinch, that's one thing. Yeah. Is that why he was in the in the prison? Because he stole Christmas? Yeah, right? He stole Christmas. <laughs> that's funny. An insult. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to say really quickly was Sis- Joseph Sisko's line about worry and doubt are the greatest enemies of a good chef, you know? Um, I just like that Cisco kept referring to his father in this episode because I believe that if it was from Jake's perspective later on in the future, he would do the same thing. My father used to say, you know, yeah. the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Or my father used mm-hmm. to say, you know, mm-hmm. and so I think I, I love that added little um, lineage of, of, of just knowledge being handed down from, you know, from grandfather to father and and, and Jake. So you know, that's all I got. Therein lies the Nam for Joseph Sisko, also Nams for Zial, Ducat, and Gowron. Uh, we do have to run though, everybody. Very special thanks. Melissa, Tim, Eve, Gull, Tierney, Anna, Homer, and Marie, and Darlena Marie has returned. Thank you all very much, and we'll see you next time on the seventh rule. Computer delete that entire log.